Well, good morning. Is it morning still? No, it's not. It's afternoon now. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Um, it's really a privilege to get to be with you guys, and um, uh, I've enjoyed the weekend, and thank you all so much for having me here. Um, Steve just said, I'm a fast talker. Uh, I'm 60 years old. I've been in the ministry for 30, I'm, I mean, somewhere between 30 and 35 minutes, uh, year, 30, 30, 30 and 35 minutes, 30 and 35 years. And um, throughout the years when I was leading lo local churches, people would say, they would come, occasionally they would come and say, could you please slow down? But could you just please, you talk too fast, could you please slow down? And I would look at them and say, it's not going to happen. <laughs> and, I, and, then I, and then I would tell them this. I said, you're just going to have to listen quicker um, and faster because uh, that's just who I am. But, um, but, you know, I am privileged to get to do what I do, and I really appreciate it. So what I want to do this morning is I want to talk to you about a principle from the court of heaven that I believe without understanding this and, and maybe getting some of this settled in our life, we're, gonna, we're not going to be effective in any realm, any realm of spiritual endeavor much less stepping into the court of heaven. Because how many of you know everything we do, we do, by, we do through the realm of faith? Everything. Everything is through the realm of faith. And if the enemy, watch this, if he can come and attack and cause us to question our identity. Everybody say identity. If he can cause us to question who we are, then he can steal from us dimensions of faith. See, in, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 21, it says, If your heart does not condemn you, you have confidence with God. But if your heart condemn you, condemns you, God is greater than your heart and knows all things. In other words, I can't play games. If, 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 if I'm condemned in my heart, if there's shame, if there's guilt, if I'm questioning some things about myself, then, then uh, the whole spirit world, if you will, knows this. But it says, if, I'm, if, if I, my heart doesn't condemn me, if I'm settled in who I am, if I'm settled in who Jesus has made me to be, he said, then I'm going to have confidence with God. See, one of the reasons we really struggle in exercising faith sometimes is because the enemy has come and he has put a question mark in our mind and our spirit about who we really are. Okay, and, 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 you know, Pastor Steve told me after the first session, he said, we've been doing a series on destiny. Well, that's really interesting because, because you can never come to destiny until you first began to understand your identity. Okay, identity is one thing, destiny is another. So, so once I began to understand who I am, then I can begin to step into the destiny that God has for me. But... If I don't know who I am, if, if I'm uncertain of that, then I'm going to have a really difficult time trying to get into the dreams and the future that God has for me. Does that make sense to you? Now, let me give you my definition for identity. My definition for identity is really simple. It is the innermost, your innermost thoughts about yourself. That's what I consider to be identity. My innermost thoughts about myself. See, see, you may think of me one way. I may want you to think of me a certain way. But how I think about myself, my innermost thoughts about me, is actually going to determine so much of what happens with me. And what's happened in the body of Christ is that th for many, many years now, we've had really, really, really great teachings on identity. Great teachings on identity. Um, uh, people trying to explain to us and explaining to us who we are in Christ and, and, and believing those kind of things. And, and a lot of it, you know, in my estimate, a lot of it come out of the, fa the faith camp. I mean, they're just tremendous when it comes to helping us understand what the Word of God says about us and how do we need to believe what the Word of God says rather than what, you know, what my own emotions tell me, what my own situations tell me. How I many of you know if you believe the right things about your yourself, eventually your situation and circumstances is going to clear up. Why? Because you're believing the right thing. Because, because and We could go into all that. But the bottom line is this. We have to believe the right things about ourselves. We have to have the right innermost thoughts. Okay. So, why is it, I'll pose a question, why is it, out of all the, the, the great teachings we have on identity, why is it we still struggle with understanding who we are? See, that, that, that's the question I want to pose. Why is there, still, is there another dynamic working that's causing us to consistently question who we are and able, never able to come into the full sense, awareness, and revelation of who God has actually made us to be? So I want to try to answer that. So look with me in Revelation chapter 12. 
And this is going to be from a court of heaven perspective because I believe that almost everything, if not everything, the enemy does, he does it from a legal perspective. He does it from a legal perspective. Like Pastor Steve just said, I mean, there's so much in the Bible about the legalities of things in the spirit world, in the word of God. It, it, it seems to be a, a, a legal dimension that, that, that we need to be aware of. So Revelation 12, verse 10 and 11. Here's what John uh, saw, heard, and experienced. He said, then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. So let me pause. He's saying there is now a full manifestation of the kingdom. Now, that verbiage in that scripture, my understanding is, it's the idea of it is come, but it's yet coming. I mean, that, that, that is true. We have, had, we have had something come into place, but the fullness of it isn't yet seen. I mean, Jesus would actually speak this way. He was the one that was to come and yet is to come. Like, like the spirit of Elijah. He came and yet he was still coming. In other words, there was the spirit of Elijah that was going to yet be released. And so the whole point is, is that there has been a manifestation of the kingdom, but there hasn't been a full manifestation of the kingdom. See, that really won't happen until the day that Jesus Christ comes back to the earth. And then there is a full millennial reign of, of, of the Lord Jesus and his kingdom being established in the earth. Okay, so, so when he says, now the kingdom of God has come, it's like it has come and yet, and yet, and yet it is still coming. And then it says this. Why is that happening? For the accuser of, our, of the brethren who accused him before our God night and day has been cast down. So let me just touch that for just a moment. Notice, if you will, that a full breakthrough comes into the earth, and let's just bring it personal, into our personal lives. A full breakthrough comes when the accuser, whoever this accuser is, is cast down. See, see, that word accuser is the Greek word kategoros, K-A-T-A-G-O-R-O-S, and it means a complainant at law. It's the idea of someone bringing a case against someone in a judicial or illegal system. So the accuser of the brethren is not somebody that's mad at you and running around telling everybody how bad you are. That's, that's a lot of times what we think the accuser of the brethren is. That's not who the accuser of the brethren is. Now, I'm not saying they can't be echoing who the accuser of the brethren is, but I am saying that, that if you really look at the scripture, the accuser of the brethren, first of all, he says he, he is, the, the, the Bible says he is the accuser of the brethren. He accuses us before God not, uh, day and night. So watch this. The first thing is this. His accusations are perpetual. So if you've got somebody in your life accusing you, as I said in the first service, every now and then they do take a breath. In other words, they don't accuse you perpetually. This accuser is accusing you perpetually. So what that means is that's not something in the natural realm. This is something going on in the unseen realm. Plus, it says he is doing it before God. See, people that are talking bad about you in the natural realm, they're not telling God about them. They're telling everybody else. Okay, so this is not something going on in the natural world. This is something that is going on in the unseen world. See, we have to understand, and I'm going to give you this. You've got to get this. One of the reasons we feel so unworthy, so condemned, so full of shame is because there is a perpetual stream of accusations coming at us from this accuser. And he creates a sense of unworthiness, and it attacks our identity. This is why you can know all the right stuff concerning your identity, but you can never, uh, you can never come into it and say, okay, this is who I really am. It never becomes a part of you because you've got this stream of accusations night and day being spoken against you before God by something called the accuser of the brethren. And we know that that's the devil. It's the devil that's this accuser of the brethren. He is actually releasing a stream. And he does this, watch this, to paralyze us and to keep us thinking wrong thoughts about ourselves. And he's doing it from a legal position. I mean, he's, he's drawing things from our bloodline. He's drawing things from our own activity. He's drawing things from our own thought processes. He's drawing, and he is just, he is just release, releasing a polluted stream of defilement and accusations consistently at us so that even though I mentally know the right things concerning who I am, 
I can never actually come into the awareness of it on a deep spiritual level. Is that making sense to you? So we have to know how to watch. So it's not enough. It's not enough just to know the right things about ourselves. We have to know how to silence the voice. Because you can play all the mind games you want to want to play. But if the voice is still spewing this stream of accusation into your spirit and about you, then you're never going to get free. And you're always going to battle these wrong, persistent thoughts of being less than what you're supposed to be. Because that's what happens. We feel like we're less than something that we're supposed to be. Now, it's interesting, this word categorous, the accuser, it, it's where we get our English word categorized from in other words what's he trying to do through his accusations he is seeking to categorize you in your own thinking see he's trying to put a definition and a defining on you that's not from God he's trying to put you in a box God never intended you to live in he wants to categorize you through the accusation. So here's what he does. He comes and spews this stream of, of perpetual accusations at you so that you're always thinking wrong thoughts. Even when you don't want to, you're thinking wrong thoughts about yourself. And it c- categorizes you. It puts you in this box. You feel like a second-rate Christian. You feel like, he's like, everybody else has, has got these wonderful testimonies and, and I never seem to get my breakthrough. And, and whatever it may be, there's just this ongoing sense of being categorized and definitions put on you that puts limits on you that you know good and well are not the limits God has for you. And, and what this creates is something called frustration. Because, because I'm frustrated because intuitively I know I'm made for something. But I've got this other a- aspect where I'm constantly being bombarded with something that's defining me and, 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 and putting a, a label on me that's not from God. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, listen. You, again, can know all the stuff you're supposed to know. But we, we got to know how to legally stop the voice of the accuser, the categorist, that is, that is slandering us before the assembly that is, that is a complainant against us in a judicial system. And if we can stop that voice, guess what's going to happen? Everything you know about your identity, everything you already know, it's also all of a sudden going to start coming into an awareness and start to make sense. Now... This accuser of the brethren, he affects two major areas. Number one, what you think about yourself. What I think about myself. And anybody that's ever battled shame and guilt and condemnation, which would be 100% of the people in this room, I promise you, you say, oh, you preachers, you got it all together. Oh, no, no. See, see you got to understand. We, we have to deal with our own issues of shame and condemnation and guilt. Because that's one of the primary Tools that this, this is that's that's what the accuser is seeking to create is shame, condemnation, and guilt. It's one of his chief things because if he can get that operating, that he he annihilates any vital faith because you can't believe God, like I said earlier. So, so the first thing that he does is he he deals with the way you think, the way I think about myself. That's the most important area, but there's a second area he actually causes others to think wrongly about you. Watch, maybe, maybe they think bad thoughts about you, or maybe they don't think any thoughts about you at all. Why? Because not only is he forming the way you think about yourself, but he actually forms the way others think about you. He whispers into their ears and says, this is who they really are. This is, this is, this, this, this is them. You don't need to have anything. Why would he do that? Because, watch this, because he understands if who you are gets unlocked and other people begin to know who you are, there's going to be doors and opportunity presented to you that's going to let you expand the rule of the kingdom. So his, his main agenda as the accuser, yeah, that's a good thing to give God some praise for. Because, because watch. The Bible says in Isaiah 9 and 7, it says of the increase of his government, 
and peace, there will be no end. Wait, how does God bring an increase of his government and peace in the earth? He can only do it when our own boundaries are increased. Because the increase of the government of God is going to come through us as his people. So God cannot increase his government unless our own boundaries are increased. But our own boundaries can't be increased if people think the wrong things about us. They won't favor us. They won't shine their face on us. We won't get the opportunities that we need. So what? One of the best places I see this in 1 Samuel chapter 10. Saul is looking for his daddy's donkeys. He's looking for daddy's donkeys. Okay, so, so he's trying to find them, so he can't find them. So him and his servant come up with this brilliant idea to go to Samuel the prophet. Because, you know, he's a prophet. He can tell us where the donkeys are. But God, it's a setup for God to get Saul to Samuel so Samuel can prophesy that he, is, he has been called and ordained and appointed to be the first king of Israel. So whenever they do come, that's exactly what happens. And so when they get there, Samuel tells him, he said, look, quit worrying about the donkeys. Just get, get undistracted. Stop worrying about the donkeys. They're found. They're found. It's okay. Okay, so just forget about the donkeys. Some of us need to forget about some stuff. Forget about the donkeys. And get focused on what you're really here for. You think you came for one reason, but you actually have come from a, for another reason. So get, get focused on the reasons you're, I really feel I need to tell you that. Get focused on why you're here. He says, and, and so what he does, he begins to prophesy to him that he's called to be the first king of Israel. But then Samuel does two significant things. He takes oil and he pours it over Saul and anoints him to be king. And he kisses him. He kisses him. Now, why did he do that? He didn't do it for just no reason. Watch. It's one thing to be anointed by God. It's another thing to be kissed with favor. See, one of our problems is we are anointed by God. We carry an anointing. But if you're not kissed by favor, the the sphere that you're allowed to use your anointing in is limited. You've got to understand, God wants to kiss you with favor. But to kiss you with favor, he's going to have to have the attitude of other people change towards you because somebody's got to favor you. But if the accuser is whispering in their ear and causing them to think wrong things about you, then the anointing you carry will always be limited. Even though it was designed to change the world. See, I was, whenever I first stepped away from pastoring, and leading a local church and began to travel, the Lord started speaking to me. He started speaking about the house of Obed-Edom. How that the Ark of the Covenant, the very glory and presence of God was in a house. But then what happened? They took it out of the house and they put it on the hill of Zion. Watch, the same anointing, the same power, the same glory that was in a house now began to bless a nation. You see, what's in you, the anointing that's in you, it may be blessing a very small, small sphere now. But if, if you can get the accuser's voice silenced and the right people can start liking you, what's in you can empower you to touch a whole nother level. You don't need a bigger anointing. You need the kiss of favor. You need the kiss of favor. You see, that's what I, was, I, that's what I had to contend for. That's what I've, I have contended for. And I've watched some things begin to open. Because watch, I knew what was on the inside of me. My wife would look at me and she would say, why can't people see it? I thought, well, maybe you're biased. <laughs> but I knew, I knew there was something on the inside of me that God wanted to use on a bigger level. But it wasn't happening Because the kiss of favor wasn't on my life. The anointing was there, but the kiss of favor wasn't there. See, how do you get the kiss of favor? By silencing the accuser that would be speaking against you. First, forming your own identity. Second, forming what other people think about you. See, isn't it interesting when the spies went over into the land, they came back and they told Joshua, man, it's a great land. But we got a problem. There's giants there. And then they said this. Watch what they said. He said, we were grasshoppers in their own sight, what they thought about us, and so we were in our own own sight. 
In other words, they think we're grasshoppers, we think we're grasshoppers. In other words, and they believe what, 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 what they felt and what other people thought about them. So you got to get this. Because God wants to change our identity. He wants to break the grasshopper mentality. See, see why, why did they think that about themselves? Because they had a slave's mentality because they still carried the spirit of Egypt. It had never been broken off of them. It took another generation to get it uprooted out of, the, out of the people of God. But the bottom line was it came from a wrong perspective. Listen, God wants to silence the accuser's voice so that the things we know all of a sudden take root and begin to affect us on a whole other level. So we break out of the box and the defining places that the enemy has put us in and we actually are free not only in the way we think about ourselves but what other people think about us let me just give you this one thing remember in jeremiah 29 we, we even sang it this morning jeremiah 29 11 i know the thoughts i think about you thoughts of not good and evil to give you a future and a hope i mean we we, we love we christians love that verse but do you realize that jeremiah was prophesying to a people in bondage he was telling me, he said, you're not getting out of here. You've got 70 years. It's going to be 70 years in captivity. Now, everything, listen, everything, everything said to them, God's not happy with us. I mean, all the prophecies, their situations, captivity, bondage, everything would have said God's not happy with us. Everything would have made them think God's thoughts are not good toward us. And yet here is the prophet saying, God's heart toward you is good and not evil to give you a future and a hope. Now watch. Why is that important? Because before they could ever come out of captivity, they had to believe the right things God was thinking about them. If we don't believe the right things God is thinking about us, you'll never get out of captivity. If you think God's mad at you, if you think God's angry at you, if you think, you know, you're thinking all this stuff about yourself, you're never coming out of the captivity. You have to first believe the right things. In other words, you have to stop believing God's thinking certain thoughts about you he's not thinking. But then you have to believe the thoughts he is thinking about you. Thoughts of good and not evil to give you a future and a hope. That's his passion towards you. So how do we do that? Let's silence the voice of the accuser. Because he's the one that's got this stream of polluted, defiling things coming. You need just to visualize that in the spirit. Just this stream of defilement just hitting your mind and your head, causing you to think wrong things. So let me just look at this for just a few moments we have left. How do we deal with this? The Bible says in Revelation 12, verse 11... They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their life and death. Those are the three things that was used to overcome this accuser and his voice. Okay, but we're going to zero in on one. We're going to zero in on which I think is the most important. The others are important as well, but I think this is the most important, is, is the, the, the blood of sprinkling. In Hebrews 12, 24, here's what he says. He says that we have come to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling. And I think that's interesting. It doesn't say Jesus' blood, even though we know it is. It's the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Now, what was the significance of, of the blood that's being sprinkled? Well, when you go over in the Old Testament, they sprinkle blood for one reason, to make the unclean thing clean. See, when a leper would come, one of the processes of cleansing the leper was they would sprinkle the blood. They would, they would take it and they would sprinkle the blood. They didn't pour all the blood. They, didn't, they weren't covered with blood. They would just sprinkle the blood. And, and out of the sprinkling of the blood, that which was defiled and unclean was made clean. See, you need to understand that, that the way the voice of the accuser is silenced is through the, the sprinkling of the blood that speaks. Because the Bible says there is a blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. See, now watch this. The blood of Jesus is a speaking blood. Please hear this. It's not just the blood that is spoken. It's a blood that is speaking. 
It's prophetic in nature. What does that mean? That means if it's a blood that had just spoken, then your past sins would be dealt with, but your present and future sins would have no atonement. But because it is a blood that is yet speaking, please get this, you are now being forgiven any sin that you commit as, as we repent and come into an agreement with what the blood is saying. Our, our sins are forgiven and they are washed away, but we are being processed into new levels of sanctification all the time. Okay, so, so the sprinkling of the blood is what silences the voice of the accuser. See, let me just put it this way. This morning I did it. I got up and I was praying. And, I, and because I understand these principles, I said, Lord, as I stand before you, I thank you that your blood, the blood of sprinkling is speaking better things than that of, uh, than that of Abel for me. And, and this is what I pray. I say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you that every voice that was speaking against me is now silenced and annulled because of what your blood is saying in my behalf. I thank you, Lord, that the blood of Jesus is speaking better things than that of Abel, and every occasion the enemy would be claiming to land a curse against me or to do something negative against me, I declare, Lord, that I agree with the sprinkled blood of Jesus that is speaking in my behalf, and that that blood is causing every voice in the spirit world to be silenced against me. Because the blood of Jesus silences voices. It silences the voice of the accuser. And it revokes his legal right against you to speak against you. See, remember Isaiah 54, 17. It said, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. What's a weapon? It can be a curse. It can be some kind of activity. It said, none of that will prosper. Why? For every tongue that rises in judgment, you shall condemn. For this is your heritage as the servants of the Lord, and your righteousness or your right to stand before him is from him. So literally, I have a right based on the righteousness of Jesus in me to stand as his servant and literally condemn every voice that's allowing a weapon to operate against me. Because weapons can't operate unless they're the voice that allows it. Weapons can't operate unless there's a voice. That's why he said, no weapon shall prosper for every tongue that rises in judgment. You'll condemn. If you'll silence the voice, the weapon will lose its power. So what I do is I come and I say, Lord, I'm going to the root of this thing, and I am declaring in agreement with your blood that your blood is annulling every right for this accuser to speak. I say his voice is silent, and therefore no curse can land against me or my family. Because there's no voice that can allow it. Because the voice is seeking a legal right. But if you'll silence the voice... All of that will be diminished and all of that will be removed. Is that making sense to you? Okay, so that's, that's, that's the way I do this. Okay, but in this, and this is very important. When you do that, when you silence the voice of the accuser, all of a sudden that stream of pollution that is literally trying to fashion who he wants you to think you are, it's cut off. And it's cut off in the lives of other people. That are literally trying to, that their attitudes about you are wrong attitudes. That you need a different attitude so that you can come into what God has for you. Because when that happens, all of a sudden, now I'm ready. Now I'm ready to think the right thoughts about me and to move into the destiny that God has for me. And I really sense in the spirit right now, God is wanting to silence the accuser's voice. He's wanting to, he, I mean, he clearly wants to do that. He's, he's the, his, his purpose this morning is to bring a silencing of that voice so that all that you know theoretically and theologically, all of a sudden it, began, it becomes yours. It becomes, and the lies, because he, he's, 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 you know, propagating lies. The lies that he is speaking, they lose their right to talk. They lose their right to talk because the accuser of the brethren, the categorist that wants to categorize us, has been cast down and been removed. So would you stand up with me this morning? Thank you for it.
Thank you, Lord. Could you just maybe pray in the Spirit for just a moment? Thank you. Just say these words. Say, Lord Jesus, I want my identity. I want my innermost thoughts about who I am to be in complete agreement with you and your word. And I repent for every lie of the accuser that I have believed about myself. Lord, I have been bombarded by his accusations. But this morning, Lord Jesus, I'm asking that his voice against me would be silenced. I would remind you, Lord, before your courts that I am bought by the blood of Jesus. That the blood of Jesus has redeemed me. That the blood of Jesus has sanctified me. That the blood of Jesus has cleansed me. And I have a right to stand before you. And I'm now asking that the blood of sprinkling that cleanses every evil part of me, every evil conscience, the innermost part of who I am, that your blood, Lord Jesus, would now silence the accuser's voice. His accusations against me would now be removed. And that I would now think correctly about myself. I also ask, Lord, that his effect against other people, the ones I need favor from, I'm asking that his voice would be silenced. Lord, because there's limits on me. There's restrictions on me. You haven't, you haven't demanded. I'm asking, Lord, for the voice of the enemy forming others' opinions about me. Let that voice now be silenced. And let them see me. And let them understand me in an entirely different way. Let them begin to think about me like they've not thought about me before. And grant me favor in their sight. Grant me favor that the anointing you have put upon me could begin to bless a bigger sphere and a bigger place. Now, Father, I just want to pray for all of us in this room this morning. I want to ask for every voice against us to be silenced. For the blood of sprinkling that is speaking better things to speak for us. We declare the accuser of the brethren. His voice is silenced. He will not define us. He will not categorize us. He will not determine who we are. But what is written in the books of heaven about us, it will determine, Lord, your purposes and your destiny in our life. Lord, we thank you for this, Lord. Lord, I, I just see an unraveling. I see like in, in minds, I see an unraveling of that which has become all entangled some of, listen, the entanglement, some of them were created by the family you came from. You think a certain way because of the family. Some from religious upbringings and influences. Some because of what other people have said. The Lord is coming right now and he's unentangling all those wrong concepts and perceptions that we have about ourselves. He's causing us to think the way he thinks. Even as I said in the first service, that new name that's written in the white stone, I say it comes upon us today, Lord Jesus.
that we began to see ourselves in a new identity and in a new way, oh God. And Father, we began to move into the destiny and the future and the purpose you have for us. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.